and um, many others to be in prayer for. Remember Miss Elka, she's still not doing very well. The doctor said she's healthy as a horse, but she disagrees with him. So, <laughs> yep, that's true. Remember her, remember uh, Paul Keene and Lisa, remember them in prayer. Is there anything else this evening we need to remember? Yes. Monday. All right. Yes, sir. Wow. Okay. Mm. Okay. All right. Mem- Anything else? Let me see anybody else. Amen. I know last week uh, Miss Shelby Beaver said that her and Dale had a prayer request unspoken, so remember them. Anything else? Not Brother Mike. Would you open us up in prayer? Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, we'll go to Revelation chapter number 3 tonight. Revelation chapter number 3 tonight. I was talking to somebody this past week, and they said, they told me that uh, they was talking about a preacher. This is bad. I shouldn't say this. This I'm going to. They was talking about their preacher, said that he's on his hundredth message out of the book of Revelation and he's only like chapter 6 That's a man he had more to say about it than John the Revelator had to say <laughs> that's terrible I'm sorry that's Revelation chapter number 3 tonight Revelation chapter number 3 we're going to deal with the church of Philadelphia they're known as the reviving the church that was faithful they're also known as the church that was feeble and tonight as we deal with that the church of philadelphia was the is the second church that didn't have any complaints from god about them I mean, that's that was a i wouldn't call them a perfect church but they had a really good track record and um and that's that would be a good thing to have is when god writes a letter to the church to be able not to have anything to say bad about it. We know that the church of Philadelphia had three different revivals. If you would say they first of all had an evangelical revival because they had a vision for the world. They had an ecclesiastical revival because it was disruptive and had such an influence. And it went against the Jude- Judaistic ritualism and legalism. And it overcame it. We need that revival back again in the Baptist church. And then they had experienced an eschatological revival. The truth of the Lord's imminent return was its beacon light. Thus the Lord stands before this church not to offer blame, but a blessing. Not the threat of a fearful vengeance, but the thrill of a fresh vision. They was very well rounded, the type of church that... Each and every one of us should have today. We get in Revelation chapter number 3, and we'll go to verse number 7. The Lord gives us a call to behold here at the church of Philadelphia. So we get to verse number 7. The Bible says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write these things, saith he that is holy, he that is true, 
He that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. When we see this tonight, we look at the call to behold. Preacher, what do you see? That when we see this tonight, the Lord three times calls on the church of Philadelphia to behold. He's In verse number 8, he said, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. When you think about that, you can't help but think about in the days of Noah, when God told Noah to build an ark, God told Noah to put a door on the ark, and who shut the door? And who opened the door? God. Twice, and then he gets here to the church of Philadelphia. What's he want us to behold tonight? He wants us to, number one, realize that all of the saints are under his control. When we think about that, the Lord saw their weakness, but he also saw their willingness. He said, I know thy works. Tonight, as a Christian, we may not be physically strong, but that doesn't mean we cannot serve in some sort of capacity. We may not be mentally strong, but we still must serve in some sort of capacity. We think about that tonight, the, knowing that the Lord has full control of our lives, full control of everything that is going on. It would help our faith as a Christian to sit back and we wouldn't worry about certain things if we say, and we're human, we're going to worry. But with that to say the Lord has control of this is a great, what's the right words I'm looking for? Should be a great boost to our faith. James said faith without works is what? Dead. Without faith it is impossible to please the Lord. So tonight you and I must have the faith to believe that God has everything under his control. We know that the Lord knows everything. He knows our past, our present, and our future. He did not take anything, did not take God by surprise of anything that has happened in your past. It's not taking anything by God's surprise of anything that's happening now. And it will not take God by surprise of anything that happens in the future part of your life. So if it doesn't take him by surprise, then we must realize that we are under his control. Does that make sense today? Think about that. He said, I have set before thee an open door. Verse number eight, for thou hast little strength and has kept my, or excuse me, and set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. For thou hast little strength, but notice this, and has kept what? My word. And has not denied my name. We think about that today when we're under the control of God, under the control of the Holy Spirit. We will have a desire, number one, to keep his word. What is his word? His word is several things. The words that are written in the Bible are his promises. We hold him true to his promises. Also, not only that, but his word is the doctrine. We hold true to the doctrine. We hold true that, he will, that not only the doctrine, not only the promise, but we hold true that of his return, that this world is our temporary home. When we think about that tonight, they held true to these things, and even though they was weak, they didn't deny the name of Christ. They was found faithful. The Bible tells us that in order to be a good steward, we must be found what? Faithful. It's required of us to be found faithful. Tonight, when we look at this church, they could have said, we're feeble, we're weak. God, we've kept your word, but God, we, we can't serve to the ability that other people can serve. We're not supposed to. We're to serve in the capacity that God has called us to serve. Not everybody can preach. Not everybody can teach. Not everybody can, can do a children's program. 
Not everybody can do the different things that we do. Not everybody can be a missionary. But God has placed his control in all of our lives that we must serve in the capacity that he has called us to. Secondly tonight, not only do we see that all of the saints are under his control. Are we good on that? For good say amen. All right, verse 9. Behold, I will make them a synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not. But do lie, behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. We think about that tonight. Not only are the saints under his control. Now think about this tonight. The sinners are under his control. There is, God will allow a sinner to do whatever a sinner wants to do. If a sinner wants to accept him, God will allow it. If the sinner wants to reject him, God will allow it. God will not force himself upon anyone. Does that make sense tonight? And when to think about a sinner is under the controlling hand of God. Well, preacher, God don't have nothing to do with sinners. The Bible says he's angry with the wicked every day. But yeah, he is. But he has a lot to do. He gives them breath. He gives them strength. He gives them the ability to work. He gives them the ability to do everything that they do. They're under his control. Think about this tonight. Think about a sinner being under the control of God. We think about that tonight. Think about Judas Iscariot. God allowed Judas to do everything that all the other disciples did. He allowed him to heal the sick, allowed him to raise the dead, allowed him to cast out devils, allowed him to do everything except this, partake of the Lord's Supper. We was talking about this the other night. The Lord's Supper, or the Last Supper, the Lord served... But he told Judah, he told him, said, whichever one I dip the sop with is the one that's going to betray me, right? The sop was not for family, but the sop was for a guest. Y'all with me tonight? Judas was not a part of the family of God. He was a guest. The Lord allowed Judas to do everything that the other disciples did. The Lord allowed Judas to betray him. The Lord allowed Judas to sell him out. To hurt him. Did it take God by surprise? No. Could God could have stopped it? Absolutely. God could have killed him before he betrayed him. But he did it. That wasn't a part of the plan of God. Tonight we must realize that. We talk about how wicked this world is and it's getting worse and worse and the Bible tells us that it would but we must realize that God is allowing it to get worse so that you and I do not get comfortable in this world. So that we will look more forward to heaven. So tonight all of the sinners are under his control. All of the saints are under his control. Are we good so far? All right, verse number 10 because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep them from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. Verse number 11, Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Not only do we see all the saints are under his control, not only do we see all the sinners are under his control, but back in verse number 10, all situations are under his control. God has control of every situation that arises in our lives. It doesn't scare him. It doesn't cause him to fear. But you and I must learn to trust in those situations. Trust that God has a plan. And whatever that plan is, you and I must accept it. We see it here. 
This promise, when we talk about the hour of temptation which shall come upon all of the world to try them, we see here tonight that this could be a likening to the great tribulation that is to come. But not all of us will face that tribulation. Us that are saved will be delivered out of this world before that tribulation. This is an assurance. He said, I will keep thee from the hour of what? Temptation. It is the assurance to the church that at the Lord's coming we will be kept from the tribulation. You think about that tonight. We There's... Well, I dealt with this a few weeks ago. I'll deal with it again tonight. There's a, there's a great argument about if we're going to be delivered out before the tribulation, during the tribulation, or after the tribulation. We have to be delivered out before the tribulation because the Lord promised to us that when he left this earth that he would send a comforter to us, and that comforter being who? The Holy Spirit, right? When... The tribulation period starts. Who's the first person to leave this earth? The Holy Spirit. So why would God leave us in an earth, on an earth, with no comforter? He wouldn't do it. So therefore, and there's some that will argue this, and we'll argue. I won't argue, but if you want to argue it, take it up with the Bible and with God. There are some that say, okay, we'll be here the first three and a half years of the good part of the tribulation. And then in the second part, when it gets back, God will deliver us out. That can't be so. The Holy Spirit ain't going to be here. Well, then we're going to stay all the way through the tribulation and we're going to see everything take place. No, God wouldn't leave us here without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comforts us. The Holy Spirit guides us. The Holy Spirit assures us. And when God saves a man, he puts the Holy Spirit inside of him. So why would God want to leave us in a place without the Holy Spirit? He wouldn't. If he's going to do that, he might as well take your salvation away. And that's a whole different conversation. We think about that tonight. We must realize that all situations are under the control of God. Wicked men may come to power and do their best to throw God off of his throne. But yet he has the ultimate control over their actions. I'll never forget a preacher preached a message on one time on God may not stop you, but you cannot stop God. God may not stop you from taking his name in vain. God may not stop you from committing all types of sin. But you're not going to stop God when God decides to pour his judgment out upon this earth and upon you. That's a, fear, that's a scary thing to think about, is it not? A call to behold, secondly tonight. Everybody good on the call to behold? For good, say amen. All right. Then I see secondly tonight, a call to behave. Now this is impossible for a lot of us, ain't it? We think about behave, we think about staying out of mischievousness. That's not where the Lord's God is tonight. We're to behave tonight as overcomers because we're not on the losing side. We're on the victorious side. We're to behave like sons and daughters of a king. The Bible tells us that we are more than what? Conquerors. In the divine initiative and view and in the divine invitation, God has called us to behave. Number one tonight, I want us to look at the divine initiative. Verse number 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is in New Jerusalem, which overcometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. We get here in the first part, he said, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. When we see this tonight, 
and he shall no more go out. The Philadelphia believers had little strength. But that is all that God needs. You think about this tonight. A two by four. Everybody knows what a two by four is, right? Okay. A two by four by itself cannot hold up a lot of weight, can it? But if you put a bunch of little two by four, if you put a bunch of two by fours together, if we was building this wall here, one two by four wouldn't hold up that whole wall, would it? But if I put a bunch of two by fours down that wall right there, every 16 inches like they're supposed to be, will that wall hold? You know what? Tonight, the church can't hold together by one person being a pillar. It takes all of us to be that part that holds the church up. He said, I want you to be a pillar. He said, I want you to find, be faithful. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse number 9, he said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. The Lord promised to make the feeble ones into the temporal pillars, the very symbol of solidarity, stability, and strength. God will use the feeble ones to support an aspect of his eternal purpose. And he, they will help but hold the eternal worship of the ages in the halls of heaven. We think about that tonight. He said, he goes a step further in this divine initiative. And he said, and he shall no more go out and I will write upon him the name of my God. Preacher, what do you see here? The overcomer will be identified with the Lord's infinite greatness. I will write upon him the name of my God. What could be the greatest part of your Christian life than to be called a pillar in God's temple and then on that pillar have, your, have the name of God written on you. The name of my God, the name that is of his own Father which is in heaven. The name that you are carrying tonight isn't, as a Christian isn't just the name of your mama, your daddy, your brother, your sister. But it's the name of God. The God that created the universe. The God that breathed life into mankind. The God who loved the world so much that he gave his only son. The God who will pour his great judgment out upon this world. And the God that will come back and deliver us. That's the name that you and I will carry. The name that he said I will write upon them the name of my God. That God there is a capital G. When we think about that tonight, to have the name of God written on us is the infinite greatness. Secondly, tonight, <clears throat> he said, in the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. The overcomer not only will be identified with the Lord's infinite greatness, but the overcomer tonight will be identified with the Lord's invincible government. The overcomer is to be eternally identified with New Jerusalem. Wherever he goes to the furthest outpost of God's vast empire, he will be instantly recognized in a member of God's government in heaven. We think about that tonight. We are blessed to be called Americans, are we not? We could have been born in China. We could be born anywhere. We go, when we go in different places, different nationalities, when they see us, they see us as what? Americans. When we go out into this world, more than seeing some of us tonight as Americans, we should be seen as Christians. People that are carrying the name of Christ, people that represent the government of God. And then lastly tonight, he said, and I will write, in the last part of verse number 12, I will write upon him my new name. 
The overcomer will be identified with the Lord's inherit glory. There are mysteries of beauty, of brilliance, and of blessings in Jesus not yet revealed to the wandering universe. When we think about that tonight, we think about heaven tonight. The Bible says that he's going to prepare a place for us. Our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. When we think about what all we have to inherit in glory. A new body, a new home, a reunion of family and of friends. We get to worship and meet the one who loved us and gave himself for us. And he said, and I'll write upon him my new name. What a blessing that will be tonight. Lastly tonight, not only do I see the divine initiative, but lastly tonight, and I'm done, I see the divine invitation. Preacher, what do you mean? Go with me to verse 13. The Bible says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the, what? Churches. You know, he finishes every church's letter with this. It's an invitation. I was, I was reading last night, the, this story of history came up, and it, made a, it, helped me make, it helped make a lot of sense to me in this point. And this is a little lengthy of a story, but I felt like it was appropriate. The Battle of Britain was at its height. Night and day, the enemy bombers flew across the English Channel to unload their cargoes of death and destruction on the cities and villages below. In recounting later what the world, what the world, uh, let me find this here, I lost my place. Where am I at? Death and destruction of villages below. The Royal Air Force had put a magnificent fight. Sir Winston Churchill in recounting later what the world owed to that valiant group of men who flew their battered hurricanes and spitfires against an incalculable odds and declared, he said, never before in the field of human conflict have so many owed so much to so few. In one lonely RAF outpost, a group of fighter pilots was gathered in the mess hall. It was a scene often repeated in those days. The men were wore out with fatigue. They were dirty, disheveled. Their eyes were blurry and beards sprouted on their chins. They were snatching a moment of relaxation before climbing in the skies again to fight off more of the Nazis. Suddenly, a buzzer sounded. A voice came over the intercom from the operations room. Bandits at 15,000 feet over P-25 over. At once, the pilots were on their feet racing for the runways, pausing on his way to the sky. Pausing on his way, the squadron leader barked back and to the intercom, one short, re short reply, message received and understood. Tonight when he says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Our reply shouldn't be, well, that was good for the church of Philadelphia. That was good for the church of Smyrna. That was good for the church of Pergamos. But our reply back to God when we read this should be message received and understood. Tonight when we hear the message of God, there are times that we will question. There are times that we will ask God why. We will ask God how. We will ask God when. But when he gives us the answer, we're to reply, I received it and I understood it. Now it's my job to do it. That's all I have tonight on the Church of Philadelphia. Any questions, any comments, any concerns? Are we all good? All right. Next week we'll deal with the church that nobody wants to be in, the Church of Laodicea, lukewarm. They're going to get spit out of the mouth of God. 